Thank you all for coming. Uh, I think uh, most of you know that I'm Gary Jenkins, the Dean of the Law School, and it is my pleasure to welcome all of you to our fifth annual MLK Convocation. Uh, each year in this event, we invite a guest to help us reflect upon the past and the future using Dr. King's message as inspiration. In this year's convocation, we are thinking about some of his words, specifically an excerpt from On Being a Good Neighbor from King's Strength of Love. That is a 1963 book that was a collection of his sermons. So what does it mean to be neighborly in our time and society? How are we moved and what are our responsibilities? Uh, I'm old enough that for at least the first 50% of my life, our society had limited access to news, right? There was the nightly TV broadcasts uh, at a certain time, the daily morning paper, a couple weekly magazines, uh, 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 and that was pretty much it. Uh, for some of our students, that probably seems crazy uh, because the second 50% of my life, of course, our lives, has been so different, right? Think about how much news, how much information that we have coming at us now. And I think that one of the many effects is that we see so many people, so many communities around the world that spark our empathy. With the onslaught of news, with social media, we experience story after story of individual crises and injustice, communities that are underserved and in need, and many larger stories of structural injustice and complex challenges. Now, while of course this better understanding of our world is important and it's good, studies and, and perhaps even our own experience shows that these stories can also have a cumulative effect of leaving people feeling overwhelmed, feeling defeated. Uh, so what can we do other than empathize? How can we move forward in the midst of large-scale challenges in individual injustice? Well, Dr. King reminds us that we have to act, right, and to quote from uh, that sermon uh, that I mentioned, no longer can we afford the luxury of passing by on the other side. In other words, our empathy must come with action. And the Minnesota law community is grounded in our mission of service and impact, grounded in the idea that empathy combined with action is extraordinarily powerful. Our faculty, our staff, our students, our alumni, our supporters are called to take action, to lead, to make an impact on the community and in the world. And here in Mondale Hall, we see faculty advising on important local and national policy, students and faculty advocating for individuals and communities in our law clinics, and today's students leading initiatives on wellness and campus climate right here uh, uh, in, in, on the West Bank. And of course, here globally, uh, here and globally, we see our Minnesota law community taking action to improve the world in all kinds of ways. The injustices are great, the challenges are complex. However, Minnesota law lawyer leaders do have the empathy, they do have the skills and the drive to take action from individuals in crisis to communities in need to large-scale injustices, it's lawyers leading the way, Minnesota law lawyers specifically. And today, we are joined by one of our great lawyer leaders, former Minnesota Supreme Court Justice, Alan Page, class of 78. Alan Page is one of the, these, those rare people who have excelled at the highest level in two very different professions. 
law and professional football. Prior to law school, Justice Page had what can only be called a storied career in football. He graduated from Notre Dame, picking up a national championship while there. He was a first round draft pick of the Minnesota Vikings, playing from 67 to 78, and then with the Chicago Bears through the early 1980s. For his success on the field, he was inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. And earlier this month, when I'm guessing many of you were watching the, football, uh, the Super Bowl on TV, you may recall that special ceremony just before the start of the game when they introduced the NFL 100, a list of the NFL's 100 greatest players of all time, of all time. <laughs> and Alan Page was among those NFL 100 players. But he's also had a remarkable second career in law. Graduating from our law school in 1978, he then worked with the Lindquist and Venom law firm, now Ballard Spar, then the Minnesota Attorney General's office. And in 1993, he joined the Minnesota Supreme Court, becoming the first African American to serve on the court and making him one of the country's pioneering and inspiring black high court justices. He remained on the court until reaching mandatory retirement in 2015. He has served on the board of directors of the Minneapolis Urban League and the Board of Regents for the University of Minnesota. He's also the founder of the Page Education Foundation, uh, which provides financial and mentoring assistance to students of color to pursue higher education. Uh, the Page Foundation was founded by the Justice and his late wife, Diane. Uh, the Page Foundation has provided more than $15 million in scholarships to more than 7,500 students. In 2018, he was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom. He is a longstanding leading voice on issues of racial uh, justice, educational equity, and social justice. Today, we're honored to have Justice Page with us. Uh, our, our topic, our theme, is our shared stakes across neighborly divides. Um, he's going to engage in conversation with uh, our friend, uh, 2L, uh, Naveen uh, Ramalingam. Uh, Naveen is a member of our Diversity and Belonging Committee. Um, and please join me in welcoming both of them for this engaging conversation. Thank you. Naveen, it's all yours. Thank you for your gracious remarks, Dean. Justice Page, it's an honor to be speaking with you. Well, thank, thank you again. You. You're welcome. Before we begin, as is the University of Minnesota custom, we acknowledge that the University of Minnesota Twin Cities, where we all learn and work, is built within the traditional homelands of the Dakota people. As Dean pointed out, with someone as illustrious as a career as you, one could pick a period of just five years and talk about it for hours long. But we have been generously allotted just 22 minutes to have this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> so let me begin by asking you this. With Dr. King's short but consequential life, there was a sea of literature that was generated and produced by him. Among all those options, why these two quotes? And why these now? What was your objective and what did you want the readers, the listeners to ruminate upon before coming to this conversation? I think it's important for all of us to understand, and I think Dr. King understood this well, is that we are all in this together. We tend to, uh, because we're individuals, we see the world differently, but the reality is that uh, 
we share this earth and that if we are going to survive as um, a world community, in fact, if we're going to survive as a local community, we have to survive as a world community. He understood that. And um, I mean, as, as, as he said, it, being neighborly, I mean, it's, it's more than just sort of being nice to those around you. We have to figure out how to live together. And um, the fact is, if you look around the globe, we don't do that very well. And um, we are um, working pretty steadily on that notion of universal suicide. A couple of years ago, around the time of Super Bowl, here in Minneapolis, there was an exhibit in the Minneapolis Central Library called Testify, Testify. Americana from S Slavery to Today, that exhibited everyday items of segregation and slavery. Those were your artifacts. And you and your late wife, Ms. Diane Sims Page, put together that exhibit. When you were talking about the exhibit, the importance of it to the press, one quote stood out. I'm gonna quote you here. You say, these items represent facts, not somebody's opinion about what happened, not somebody's view about what did or didn't occur, but actual facts. They help me understand where we are today, the disparities in education, our criminal justice system. For me, the message I get is that we haven't come to grips with the discrimination that comes with those facts. We haven't addressed the present effects of that past history, that past discrimination. Why do you think the United States as a country hasn't had a comprehensive national reckoning about the twin original sins of the Native American genocide, the transatlantic chattel slavery, that enslaved hundreds and thousands of former West Africans. In the absence of such a reckoning, what do individuals do to make up for it? Well, the why, part of it is that, um, it's interesting we we're in a, here in a law school when you asked that question, because part of where we are today is grounded in our past legal decisions. Uh, the fact that um, beyond legal decisions, you go back to the Constitution. Just think about the notion that um, my ancestors and were considered three-fifths of a person. Now the argument is, that, well, that just had to do with voting. Well, excuse me. Uh, and we're still grounded in that. Um, the, the, the precedent that we, that is, that, that we work with today is grounded in that history. Um, and you're right, we haven't figured out how to come to a reckoning to move us beyond that history. Um, but I think until we do, we will continue down the road we're on. You know, what can we do? Well, first of all, we can all be intentional about addressing issues of discrimination, issues of race. It can't be, it, it's not enough for us to 
simply acknowledged that it, you know, that there was slavery and that discrimination still goes on and um, let's get over it. We have to be intentional about working to um, move on. That means intentional both as it relates to others, uh -huh. but also intentional as it relates to ourselves. Because we all have our own biases. We all um, have our own prejudices. And unless and until we come to grips with those, it's pretty hard for others to, to do the same. We, 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 we want to live in a um, colorblind society, but living in a colorblind society should not mean living in a society that is blind to racial bias. And the, the first place that we can make changes in ourselves, setting aside our own biases, setting our own, setting aside our own prejudicial view of, of groups of people, and uh, really doing what Dr. King stood for, judging people by the content of their character. One of the things that we seem to want to do today is ignore the fact of racism. We, we tend to want to um, well, I mean, I I, well, I'm going to go there. <laughs> you know, we, we, we see an overtly racist act or an overtly discriminatory act, and we say, no, that didn't happen. Even though by all uh, objective reasonable observations, you know it did. We, we, we say up is down uh, when it's really up. We say black is white. Uh, we say, and, and, and our, our leadership does that. Mm. And uh, so it's easy for other people to um, gives them license to follow in those footsteps. And, and that's a problem because that's taking us backwards. Long answer to no. relatively short <laughs> question. You pointed out that we need to go back to the words of Dr. King. And um, there is this idea of a dual image, if you will, of the convenient Dr. King and the quote-unquote dangerous Dr. King. Meaning, the year before Dr. King was assassinated, 66% percentage of Americans disapproved of him. He challenged white supremacy, spoke out against militarism, was the biggest opponent of Vietnam War and denounced the gross concentrations of wealth alongside unconscionable levels of poverty. And why is that dangerous? <laughs> his, his last major campaign was the Poor People's Campaign, which William Barber in North Carolina just resurrected last year. He was denounced as a radical, divisive, and unrealistic. Turn to year 2020, there is this static Buddha-like, Chris Christ-like image of Dr. King that some people call has been euphemized or made palatable to an upper-class suburban audience. Would 
did we lose because of this euphemization, so to speak? Well, what, what, we've, what we've done is um, what they did then was demonize his work. And whether you're talking about racial discrimination, whether you're talking about uh, his work with the poor, his, I mean, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm sort of at a loss for words as to why that isn't as important as his, his, the day before he died, he was in, or the day he died, he was in Memphis to march with garbage workers. Now, it had connotations of race because many of the garbage workers were black. But it was also about empowering people to collect, through collective action. You know, I can't separate those two. Uh -huh. um, and I don't think we should separate those two. I think we have to look at um, the whole of Dr. King and the whole of his work and understand that um, it's sort of all the same and that when we when we praise what he did, we have to praise all of what he did. Mm -hmm. We can't ignore those parts that um, are inconvenient, that we think are inconvenient, which in fact get at the heart of uh, some of the most difficult and challenging problems we say that we face as a, as a society. Those issues, hunger, homelessness, um, workers' rights, those issues are here today, uh -huh. uh, as is the issue of white supremacy. Some might suggest that, that in some ways they're inextricably linked and that um, you can't address one without addressing all of them. So as a kid growing up in Canton, Ohio, in a predominantly black neighborhood in Canton, Ohio, in the late 40s and 50s, and around the time, the civil rights protests, 1964 Civil Rights Act, 1965 Voting Rights Act, you would have been in your late teens, a little over 20. What was your impressions of when these protests were going on before the Civil Rights Act was passed? There was their hopefulness in terms of these changes can happen and then coming back now, some would say we're taking one step forward, two step backward. And can you envision that hope coming back to achieve those seminal changes? Well, I can remember a couple of things. I, one of the, the, the things that's had a big influence on my life was the Supreme Court's decision in Brown. Um, I remember being inspired by that, encouraged by that, and having the sense that there was power in the law. But I also remember uh, 1955, uh, the murder of Emmett Till, and recognizing that really the only difference between me and Emmett Till is that I wasn't there. Um, I remember the, the reading about the, the Montgomery boy, bus boycott and Dr. King and sort of knowing about him during that time period. And, and, and it was frightening. Uh, 
frightening in the sense of here is somebody who is willing to stand up for what is right and with potentially uh, life-threatening consequences. And yet he had the courage to do it. And thinking, I don't know if I would have the courage to do that. Um, then, you know, as time went on, the, the 60s come along with the, both the uh, the active civil rights movement across the country and the anti-war movement. Um, and by then I was a football player and, you know, you sort of get focused on that and not that you ignore the other, but you're watching it from afar. Mm -hmm. uh, 1963, I was at, uh, in training camp, a freshman at the University of Notre Dame. My first experience away from home when the bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church occurred. And you just, I mean, I felt sick to my stomach um, that these things were happening and it seemed like nobody had any control of it. Um, sort of, all of that sort of gave me a sense of of purpose and a, a sense of purpose in, in, in that somehow those injustices had to be dealt with. I didn't have any clue about how to go about doing that, mm -hmm. but um, that somehow the law could play a role in it. And that was sort of my interest in the law from long before I started playing football. And, you know, uh, fast forward to today, when we have national leaders um, spewing hatred, promoting white supremacy, um, doing everything would seem to, in, in putting America first, talk about uh, working against Dr. King's principle and bringing this all together um, and, and taking us down the road of universal suicide. It, it's just, it's on the one hand discouraging, on the other hand, um, I, I, I still believe that each one of us in our individual actions and in our collective actions can change and make change and begin to give true substance to uh, Dr. King's work, not just to his words, but his work. I would like to talk about one of your passion projects, which is education. Some people may know this, Justice Page, along with the Minneapolis Federal Reserve President, Neil Kashkari, they have proposed a constitutional amendment. The part of the current educational class of the Minnesota Constitution, which was established in 1857, 150 years ago, around the time the state was established. Uh, and, and, and remember what was going on 157 years ago, <laughs> and who was not included in that in what they were thinking about in terms of education. Clearly, people of color weren't. And women weren't. Mm -hmm. And so, 
if we did nothing else but modernize the Constitution to include people of color and women, that would be a lot. <laughs> if, we did, if we did nothing other than that. Right. But there's far more to do than simply that. I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, question. that's all right. <laughs> um, the parts of the current um, educational clause reads that it's the duty of the legislature to establish general and uniform system of public schools. That's the operative phrase, uniform system of public schools. But your proposal, which is titled Equal Right to Quality Public Education, reads all children have a fundamental right to a quality public education that fully prepares them with the skills necessary for participation in the economy, our democracy and society, as measured against uniform achievement standards set forth by the state. It is a paramount duty of the state to ensure quality public schools that fulfill this fundamental right. Since statehood, Minnesota has had 213 constitutional amendments that were proposed. 120 of them have been adopted. Middle of the 19th century, they changed the method of adopting, amending the constitution from a simple vote majority to the, both the houses passing it in a simple majority and then putting it up for a vote. Tell us more about this initiative and what is the significance of it at this moment? Well, the, the initiative is about attacking the gaps in performance between white students, let me back up, between middle class and wealthy white students and students of color and poor white students. Students of color and poor white students across the state, no matter what part of the state you're in, show the same deficits in performance. And it's unconscionable that we seem to accept, be willing to accept, clearly, um, and I don't have the precise numbers in front of me in terms of graduation rates and the, and the, the spread of these uh, performance gaps, but they're staggering. And we should all be outraged. Over the past 20, 30, 40 years, people have worked hard in good faith to try to um, eliminate these gaps. But the fact is that adult considerations have gotten in the way. Political considerations have gotten in the way. And Neil and I feel that uh, our proposed amendment could be a catalyst for change. Mm -hmm. um, the current constitution focuses on the educational system. And our Supreme Court has uh, said that there is a fundamental right to that system of, of education. And it, it also focuses on inputs to that system. Our amendment would shift the focus somewhat to children and outcomes and hold the state standard, uh, hold the state accountable for those outcomes. There has been um, some resistance. The resistance is, um, has been frustrating because it's not, I mean, it's not grounded in, um, well, the, the, the resistance suggests that we are, that our, that our proposed amendment would, um, for example, be the end of public education because it would provide for vouchers to go to private schools and all that. And it's, you know, one of the things I learned to do on the court is we deal in facts. Indeed, when I was talking about a year or so ago, talking about testify, mm -hmm. we have to deal in facts and words matter. 
the um, it, they, 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 there's also this claim that it'll somehow in public the funding for public schools the current language has a specific clause that uh, relates to funding but if somebody can explain to me um, how the words, it is the paramount duty of the state to ensure quality public schools that fulfill a child's fundamental right, promotes something other than public education in public schools, I would like to hear it. Uh, I, I, why, they make that argument, I don't know, because it's nonsense. Um, I think those who make that argument have some other agenda. Uh, and in those same words, how they can take from that that, um, that somehow funding is gonna go away. I, I mean, it is the paramount duty there is no other provision in the Constitution that makes anything a paramount duty. Mm -hmm. This is the highest of duties to ensure quality public schools. The only way to, the only way that anything gets paid for is through the legislature. The only way that, uh, the only sources of revenue not the only, but the primary source for revenue for anything that gets done in the state is taxation. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I mean, I would rather be dealing with whatever their real concerns are than having to knock down these uh, arguments that just aren't grounded in reality at all. And uh, for the audience, the numbers that Justice referenced the Minneapolis Fed has come up with an exhaustive report and they've released it on their website. And our own Myron Arfield, Professor Myron Arfield, through the Institute on Metropolitan Opportunity, have done extensive studies in the metro cities. So if you guys are interested, you can reference them. Um, I, and also, I, would, I would say your own, uh, Professor Orfield, we've had some discussions with him. He, he likes some different words. Um, and we're thinking about how to deal with that, but at least his concerns go to something specific and concrete mm -hmm. and raise um, concerns, concerns I don't think are as great as they are, but at least they're legitimate, as opposed to some of these arguments which are not grounded in anything other than um, we tend to live in a time that if you say it long enough and loud enough, people will believe it, even though it is demonstrably false. And, and can I just say, um, for all of you students and faculty and whoever else is here, you know, we can have a robust debate about the reasonable inferences to be drawn from facts. But we can't have our own facts. The world will not work if everybody's got their own facts. It just, it can't work. Um, and so this notion that you can lie and it doesn't matter, or if it takes a lie to prevail, that's okay. Uh, I think that will be the end of us as a society. The fact is that the truth matters and facts matter. And why does, why does truth matter? because truth is inextricably linked to trust.
And if you don't have truth, I don't see how you can have trust. And if you can't trust, you don't have anything. How do people interact at all if you can't trust the people you're interacting with? I have uh, pages and pages of more questions, but I think we are coming up on our time for audience questions. So um, let me just ask this final question. Again, this is a personal question, so excuse me. Can you tell us about Ms. Diane Sims' page, her life and legacy, and uh, what she meant to you? Um. She means the world to me. She meant the world to me. She was um, a co-conspirator. <laughs> she was a partner. She was a leader. Smart as a whip. Um, very little tolerance for people who um, had agendas that were um, other than just. She was a champion for justice. She was fierce in her belief in how we go about making this world a better place. Uh, fierce in her belief that we all should have the opportunity to excel, to achieve whatever our highest self may be. Um, she he didn't want to get on her wrong side. <laughs> um, very, very low tolerance for nonsense. And she, amazingly, she was a doer. I mean, she had great with ideas. She had the ability, you know, there is this thing we, we talk about, sometimes used to talk about women's intuition. She, you walk in the room, she had you figured out before you were two steps in. <laughs> she knew, she, I mean, and, and she was spot on. Um, and she was just a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful human being, a phenomenal mother phenomenal grandmother, um, and I miss her dearly. Thank you so much for sharing those thoughts. We will now open the questions to the audience. I think there are mics on both ends. Can I just also say, you know, the things that I've accomplished And she was there hand in hand. Um, and, and the Page Education Foundation, um, she she made it happen. She, when I joined the court and I couldn't do the fundraising anymore, she picked up the ball and um, made it happen. And she was um, quite an accomplished, quite an accomplished human being and, and didn't want to stand up and receive the credit. She spent all of her time making sure that I got the credit. But she was the one that um, was responsible as much, if not more so, 
for all the things that I've had the good fortune to mm -hmm. be able to do. And I just, I, I will tell you one story. By all means, please. <laughs> I mean, first of all, I mean, I, I met her by pure serendipity uh, out in the lobby of General Mills. And one day she, I mean, the, I was there for a meeting and had left the, left the building, got to my car and left my keys inside the building. So I had to go back. She was walking in while I was waiting for my, somebody to bring me my keys. And she asked me, um, she walked in with somebody. I didn't know who she was. She walked in with a, a coworker. They were going to a meeting. And he said, the, the guy she was with, her boss said, um, oh, there's Alan Page. Would you like to meet him? I don't know who he is. He walks up, <laughs> introduces himself, introduces her. I say hello. I mean, she's drop dead gorgeous, right? <laughs> and I um, said hello. And she said, I volunteer at a boys club, at the, at the boys club on Blaisdell in Minneapolis. Now, here's this white woman. 26 years old, volunteering in an inner city boys club. And I'm thinking, hmm, that's interesting. Um, turns out I sure say, sure, I'll go to the boys club with you. And one thing led to the next. But then, um, you know, this is, this is 1973, so what, 19 years after Brown? Mm -hmm. uh, eight years after the Civil Rights Act? Seven, six years after the Supreme Court decided Loving versus Virginia? Uh, 1973, we get married. 1983, I get invited to speak at the University of Mississippi. So now we're 30 years removed from uh, Brown, 29, um, and not at all far removed from uh, George Wallace in Alabama saying segregation now, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever, and the, the federal troops having to uh, escort James Meredith to classroom to class at the University of Mississippi. We go to Mississippi together. Didn't phase her a bit. <laughs> In fact, it didn't phase me a bit either. But at the time, we were runners, and uh, was it was speaking at the law school, and they put us up in the campus hotel, one of these nice antebellum mm. mansions. And I'm thinking, and she's thinking, once we get there, what, what have we done? <laughs> <laughs> and we're, we're both runners, but so I give my speech that night, and one of the things I mentioned to the, the people there is that we're runners and we're going to get up and go running before we... Um, leave the next day. Now you can imagine this black man and white woman mm -hmm. going out and running in Oxford, Mississippi in the middle of the night, you know, because it's, we go out at six in the morning, it's still dark at six in the morning. We go out and they, we tell them we're going to go out and they say, well, oh, well would you like somebody to go running with you? Oh, we're, we're fine. You know, we're, we'll be okay. Oh, we'll, we've got a professor, one of the professors, he's a runner. He'll go with you. Okay, whatever. Turns out the, the poor professor that they sent out with us was not a runner. <laughs> and it's, you know, it's 70 degrees and it's, it's warm and humid. And we almost killed this poor guy. <laughs> but they weren't going to let us go out by ourselves. 
So, it, and she was game for that. That was, I mean, that was right up her alley. And um, I was, I was, I was extremely, extremely, I can't tell you how lucky I was the day I met her. So, anyway, questions? <laughs> I th you know, I think we all have some obligation to speak out. Athletes, um, turns out, have a bigger megaphone, but only because we give them a bigger megaphone. I think all of us have uh, some obligation to do what we can to work toward the just society. And the fact that you happen to be an athlete or entertainer or some celebrity uh, doesn't change that obligation. It doesn't necessarily, um, I mean, obviously, we have to listen to what they're saying and see what they're doing. Um, just because you're an athlete or celebrity doesn't make what you say more important or more valuable. But when um, someone, no matter who it is, has a contribution to make, has some thoughts that, and, and, and can garner some support to move people along, uh, we should celebrate that. Not because they're athletes, but because their ideas and their actions are going to make the world a better place. Yes. How do you think we can bring the call to change and the call to neighborly connection into this building? into legal education, into the classroom. I mean, you talked about how inspired you were around the Board of Education Forward. Um, and I wonder whether you have thoughts for us about changes that we should be considering to legal education. I haven't thought about it. Um directly, but one of the, I, I, I think one of the things that the, that law school should be looking at is that connection between today's discrimination and its roots in the past and how we can uncouple those roots from the past so that we can address the present effects of past discrimination. I mean, until we do that, I, I think we're just trapped in the same vicious cycle. And what better place uh, than the law schools, both here and across the country? Is I. I, 
I, I think until we finally do that, as I say, I think, I think we're just trapped. You know, because I, I get the fact that the people who are here today didn't engage in slavery. But some of us who are here today are beneficiaries of that slavery. And that slavery's effects linger today. And so lots of great minds in this room And um, it strikes me that that would be a worthwhile endeavor. We have time for perhaps one last question. Over there. Hi. Um, so you talked about how. Okay. Uh, so you just talked about how the conversation um, and the recognition that racism is deeply embedded in the root of this country, needs to be, how that needs to be recognized. Um, how would you suggest conversations be had in a way that's constructive, that may not be othering? Um, I, won't, I once spoke to someone who said basically something along the lines of, well, if you look at me like I'm the villain, I will look at you like you're the villain. So how do we have those conversations in a constructive manner? Well, first of all, we have to do more than recognize. But I, I, I think the conversation has to be look. You weren't here, you didn't do it, but you're a beneficiary of it. And how do we go on from there? There has to be some recognition at some point that, uh, you know, that that is simply the case. Nobody wants to be called a racist. Nobody wants to be accused of being a racist. And I don't think that that has to be I, mean, I, I, I think in any conversation we have and we must have the conversation but I also think we have to act. It is not a enough to simply admire the problem. We have to be activists. We have to be intentional. We have to um, stop segregating ourselves. We have to um, recognize where the other person is coming from. And I think when we do that, the conversation can be easier. But it's got to be more than a conversation. And it's also got to be more than, or it has to be more than simply fighting over every little microaggression that comes along. We get caught up in that. We could waste a whole great deal of time and not accomplish much.
I wish we could go on for another couple of hours here, but <laughs> um, thank you so much to Justice Page for joining us in this conversation and for giving us a lot to think about in terms of our shared stakes. And on behalf of the Diversity and Belonging Committee, I want to invite everyone who's here and people who weren't able to be here in person to engage, show up to the conversations where you can explore what stakes you have with someone else, figure out what it means to act in a way that is um, going to uh, address some of those deep historical inequities which are with us every day. Um, how do we support one another in speaking out? How can we be amplifiers for one another? So if you have an idea, if you've done scholarship, if you've been doing some advocacy, um, let us know. Our Justice Gap series is looking for speakers coming up. Uh, we also will be um, sending around information about a number of um, upcoming book discussions, um, other types of, of media. There's a lot of great material out there that's really thought provoking. We wanna make sure that these conversations and actions arising out of them continue. So thank you, Naveen. Um, thank you, Dean Jenkins. And thank you, Justice Page. We're so honored to have you. Thank you so much.